we're back for another one. It's been a minute. So if you guys are listening on Apple, Spotify, and you guys are watching on YouTube, thank you guys for your patience. But I have a, and I do say this, Shanae, every time, a special guest, but I feel like each time it gets better and better in its own unique way. But today, today, I have Shanae Levette. Yeah, Levette. Yes. Urkard, right? Not only is she a, a wife, she is also a lyricist, spoken word yes. artist, a author. Yes. Am I missing some? Oh, yes. you're, you're the recruiter cousin. I Thank am. you for coming on to the show. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm doing pretty good. God is faithful. My birthday is in three days, so I will be 34 in three days. So I'm you excited. You a baby too? Yes. My, be- my birthday is at the end of the month. Let's do it. I see. The thing is, I'm a perfect example of a Gemini. I tell people, I tell everybody that in five minutes, I may not feel like it. So them two faces that we got, we they real. <laughs> so just, just don't get on our bad side. <laughs> <laughs> no, I try to be nice. I try to be nice either way. Well, that's why we got Jesus in our life. You know what I'm saying? That's why we got God. That's right. There it is. You know, uh, but thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to tap in, like, and, and to be fully transparent, my tribe, my audience, they know that, you know, uh, I just got laid off, right? So I come from that recruiting uh, capacity and things of that nature. That's the lay of the land. That's what it is. But I've been, yeah. let me tell you, Sinead, I've been, you know, tapping into my network, right? So on YouTube and different mm-hmm. playlists I have on YouTube, hey, do this. And I'm kind of on TikTok, you know, showing people what I'm doing to get my yeah. next opportunity. But I just want to thank you so much. And I'm pretty sure, guys, if you guys are listening, leave a five-star review. Tell Shanae what you guys thought of this episode, because I know she's about to drop some bars, some gems for you guys that are <laughs> transitioning. Or if you're looking to get into a different industry, she's going to have all the tips and, and tricks of the trade to help you get there. So let's start early childhood. How was that for you? And how did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, so I grew up in Jersey, so I am a native of of Camden, New Jersey. I grew up in the kind of Jersey, Philly uh, area. And so Jersey, Philly, Delaware, that tri-state area was pretty much all the same thing for us. Um, I started writing poetry when I was 11. So one of my cousins, he actually taught me how to dribble a basketball. So I've also been playing basketball since I was five. So one of my cousins was killed in North Philly and I wrote my first poem about him. And I learned in my kind of early years that poetry was a way for me to release. And it was a way for me to stay out of trouble. Like I always say poetry saved my life. So that the motivational speaking side of myself comes from that poetry kind of background. So I did my first poem in church when I was 14. Uh, I didn't realize that be, doing poetry at 14 would turn into this. So Um, so I wrote my first book, uh, at 23, my second book at 26 and my third book at 29. Uh, I am, I went to St. Augustine university in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, majored in political science, went a minor in English. I went on to graduate law school from North Carolina central university school of law. Um, and then I pivoted into from legal into recruiting for first starting in higher education in healthcare and now big tech. So it sounds like you're a lot of things, right? So you're a lyricist for mm-hmm. sure. Your background definitely mm-hmm. gave you the skill set and right the passion yeah. to be able to do what you're doing now. Now I, I have a question. Did you feel like it's your gift or do you feel like it's something that you kind of like over time like refined and you made that's your skill, right? Do you feel like you're naturally uh you know a coach and and great at recruiting? I think that is, I think motivational speaking is my gift that I tie into recruiting. So recruiting to me is simply getting people into a job and getting hired. I actually encourage people throughout the process. So I get a chance to marry motivational speaking and spoken word with my actual nine to five. So when I became a recruiter, when God allowed me, because I prayed about it and I asked for permission, And when God gave me the go ahead, I made a promise to him that I would never forget my first passion, which was motivational speaking, spoken word. And I also told him that I would never forget what it felt like to be a candidate. 
So I made my promise that if he allowed me to go into this field, that I would do it for his glory and his glory alone. That meant that whatever hard decisions that I had to make throughout this journey, as long as God is with me, then, and I'm doing it for him, then I'm okay. Uh, Have I been challenged in the process? Of course, yeah. But I would think that, I would think the recruiting part is a skill that I have refined over time because it does take some market knowledge. It takes legal knowledge. It takes um, actual experience as a person and understanding the difference between the candidate urgency and your urgency, which is entirely on a different spectrum. So that's the skill you refine over time. But I think the motivational part and getting people confident in who they are throughout that process is 100% a gift. Now, I, I just followed you today on like Instagram and it was another platform, but I believe we've been rocking together on uh, LinkedIn for a while now. So you guys be sure to, yeah. to tap in with her on her, her inbox. She'll get right back to you just like she got back to me. But I want to uh, go back mm-hmm. and, and, and ask you, about that, you, you mentioned something about urgency, uh, the, the client's urgency and the, mm-hmm. what was it? The candidate's urgency. Can you break that down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where that comes from, that comes from a plate, a personal place. So in 2015, I went through probably the worst depression of my life. And I started to understand that my urgency was different from other people's urgency who wasn't going through what I was going through. My urgency was please answer the phone now. Like, please save my life now, please do this now, 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 where someone who is not dealing with what I'm dealing with, their urgency is not the same. Their urgency is wait five minutes and then I'll get to you or I'll talk to you tomorrow. Where when you're a candidate, it's the same thing. When you're a candidate and you need a job like yesterday, the urgency is whoever recruiter or hiring manager I'm talking to, please, can you help me now? I've literally been searching on my own and I just need help now. We don't know what that candidate is dealing with in the moment. We, I've come across so many candidates who have lost homes in this market. I've come across candidates who've had to sell things, who can't pay their bills, who all kinds of things. And so I spend a lot of my personal time talking to people because I know what that urgency is. I, and I, and for me, like the Bible says, um, um, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift us as a week, but I have prayed for you so that, so that your faith won't fail. And when you have returned, come back and strengthen your brother. It's my duty to come back and strengthen the people who needs to be strengthened because I was once someone who also needed that strength. And so I, I try to match that urgency because I also know that I am help, helping to save a life where you may absolutely be about to walk off a ledge. And if it takes me 30 seconds to say, hey, how are you doing to just respond to a DM, then that urgency for you is different for me because I am not feeling personally what you're feeling. So, for example, I reached out to uh, I had somebody reach out to me randomly on LinkedIn and she asked me about a job with another company that I used to work for. And she asked me if I knew who was over the position. I didn't. But I text one of the recruiters of the company to see if she knew. And she said, oh, actually, that's my role. So I was like, oh, cool. So I said, so-and-so is looking for, looking to go into this role. Do you mind taking a look at her skill set for me? So she said, of course. So I asked her, asked the recruiter if I could give the candidate her credentials so that she can email her. And so she said, yeah. And so the candidate reached out to me this morning and said, the recruiter did respond. And she said, five minutes of you responding could have very much changed my entire future. So that urgency that may not be urgent to me because I'm in my job where the job market is saturated with a bunch of candidates, y'all urgency is different. And so I can't forget, I was a candidate for four years before I got into recruiting. So I will never forget and made that promise to God and to myself that I would never forget that candidate urgency because I was once that candidate who had an urgency. Wow, that is so profound. So, you know, you you said you just spoke about four years and, you know, before I had my last role was like 11 months. Right. So hey, we, we were going, I'm, I'm sure, through the similar things like, oh, man, you know, wifey, like she likes stressing. And I'm like, oh, OK, baby, I'm trying. I'm doing all these things. But I'm like, mm-hmm. and believe in God in that season. Right. And you can, you know, tell us about the things that you were doing in that season be- mm-hmm. before you got it. You were still believing. 
you know, it says in the Bible, hey, somebody gonna get saved today. Somebody gonna get saved. <laughs> somebody good. gonna get saved and a job. Uh, but <laughs> what I was doing was just like in my word, devotion, working out, applying for jobs, tapping into my network. So kind of like walk us through that four year period. Uh, you know, what you yeah. were doing during that time. <laughs> Um, I was mad at God a lot. The one thing I've learned, I, the one thing about me and God's relationship is he let me be mad because I'm his kid. So and if if I'm his, he let me throw my tantrums because I'm going to do it. And he like, all right, when you're done, I'll be here. Just let me know when you're done. And I go and I say, I'm sorry, like everybody, like every kid does. So that four year process for me went like this. I studied for the North Carolina bar the first time I didn't pass. Second time I didn't pass. Third time, by the third time I was working, I was working as a behavioral specialist in a school that my aunt was a principal in. So I was a contractor in her school. And so um, I was making like $15 an hour or so. And I and very much a prideful, swallow your pride moment because I have a law degree, I'm making $15 an hour. So I was like, swallow your pride, you gotta pay, you pay bills. So uh, so it, it went from me actually working that $15 an hour job and studying for the bar at the same time with a tutor and actually being on the schedule. I, that, that third time I took the bar was the highest that I had scored, but I still didn't pass. So I got to a point where I was still in that contract role. The, the thing about the contract role was the student that I was assigned to, if they didn't come to school, I didn't have to work that day which meant my paycheck was contingent upon that kid being in school. The the unique thing about that was in that situation, my aunt was the principal of a mental health type mm. of school system. So there were, there were a lot of times where kids would need to go to crisis or we would have to restrain, or it was a lot of physical stuff that we had to do that I wasn't used to. So if a kid was absent for whatever reason and I wasn't assigned to the kid, she would just either try to find something for me to do or I just couldn't work at it. So it went from that to I was there for a year and a half to now I'm about to move back to North Carolina. My husband, my he was my fiance at the time, literally holding down the fort. I get another legal contract role that is project based that once the work is done, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So now, and I'm still trying to find this full-time job at the same time. I ended up getting two contract roles at the same time, which was literally burning me out because I was literally like burning at two ends of the candle, just trying to make sure I was making as much money as possible. Those two contract roles ended five days apart from each other, three weeks before our wedding. So I went into my wedding day, very much unemployed. And and praise God that a lot of our honeymoon stuff was already paid for, so I didn't have to think about a lot of that. So throughout that, throughout that time, it was very much like a test of my, my faith. It was a test of, you're the motivational speaker, you're the spoken word artist, you're the one who's always encouraging, but where your faith at? So it was very much like be, testing what I was supposed to, be operating in in my own faith. And I I got a I got a great opportunity to watch my husband in his faith. Cuz he would always say like, "Oh, you're going to get a job." It wasn't a like, "When you going to get a job?" It was just like, "It'll come. Don't worry, it'll come." And so, I was very blessed to have a partner who understood I am 100% trying my best. Mm -hmm. I then found Lyft. So I was like, "All right. I found Lyft." Lyft is actually doing a little bit of, of things for me. I'm able to kind of like, you know, make as much money as possible. But I also started to feel the wear and tear on my body. So then I'm like, OK, well, I can't <laughs> do this for however long because it's going to make me hurt. Like I'm going to be stiff and in pain and all of that. So I eventually went into Duke Temporary Service, which is another contract role where I literally was placed inside of Duke's law school in the law clinic as a secretary with a law degree. So it was very much, I had a very, a lot of prideful, like put your pride aside and get it done. And so my second assignment was, I then went into Duke temporary service. Again, the second assignment, the business line that I was actually going to be supporting was uh, Duke talent identification program, which was Duke tip, which is where I met 
my now mentor who taught me how to recruit and that's how I got into recruiting. So it, so when I finally met the right person to tell me, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what you need to focus and teach me, she broke my resume down, rebuilt it. I ended up applying internally with Duke and got a job within two months of her actually working with me. So four years plus two months, right? Of getting to the right person. But throughout that process, I had countless people ghost me. Like I had recruiters ghost me and attorneys who said that they would help me because I, we all went to the same school and I interned under some of these attorneys and judges. And so they were telling me like, yeah, I don't mind helping you. Of course, I'll help you with whatever you need. And then we have one talk and then that's it. So I understand, I understand what it feels like to be ghosted and all of that, which is why I spend so much time responding to people because I know what that feels like from just from a personal place. So that four year period was 100% a test of my faith, but but it was also a place of now, of course, hindsight is 2020. 20, so it was a place of not only just growth, but grit. It was a place of like, now I can talk to people from that place because I know what that four year period was like, where some people say, I've been looking for a job for six months. I've been looking for a job for a year, so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, I look for one for four. So I didn't get my first full-time salary role until four years after I got my law degree. So it took me a minute. Now, was I unemployed? Was I unemployed the entire time? I had contract roles, which a lot of people do, but those contract roles end and you have to find an end. And that hustle doesn't stop. So literally from to date, December of 2015 to January of 2020, of uh, four years and a month to date is when I was able to land my first salary job. And that process, <clears throat> I tell people all the time, that process is not for the faint of heart, but it made me understand, again, the urgency of people and what they need now. Had I not gone through that, I, didn't, I wouldn't have understood their urgency. Wow. We have to unpack. You have so many gems in there. And if you guys are listening on, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure you guys ask your questions uh, in the comment section. But I want to go back to what you were talking about, like just like that, that mentorship. I think a lot of people miss that. Right. So mm-hmm. you were just like, oh, like you had the tribe or people you went to school with, you know, but they mm-hmm. have so much bandwidth. Oh, yeah, I got you, girl. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. One, right. But then you found that one person and that was the life changer right there. Shout out mm-hmm. to your mentor, whoever that is. Yeah, but- Danita is everything. Her name is Danita. She is the GOAT, hands down. So so let's let's talk about that, that relationship that you still have to this day with your mm-hmm. mentorship, because I think we can help a lot of people if they're able to identify, you know, what makes a good mentor and how to go about getting one. Yeah. So Danita... Danita told me when I first when I first met her, she said that she saw something in me. And so here's here's how it's it's interesting because this is what she told me. When I went into my interview, I tell everybody do exactly the exact opposite of what I did. Do not do what I did when I went into my interview with Danita, which was if she said, do you know a lot about tip? I said no, because at this point I was done with looking for it. Like I was so over it that anything she asked me, my mind went blank. And and I didn't realize that the recruiter actually did prepare me, but I was so over it that it just got to a point where I was just like, I don't, but you're welcome to tell me. And she told, <laughs> she told me, like, I was just like, tell me, tell me, girl, wait. So she told me about it. I was like, oh yeah, like I actually started getting excited. Like, oh yeah, Renee did actually explain to me mm-hmm. what Duke Tip is and what it's about and all that good stuff. So... But after she interviewed me and hired me and everything, she said to me, she said, Shanae, I'm really, I'm really happy. I'm the one who interviewed you. I said, why? She said, because at the time I had a full head of hair. And at the time I had faux locks in my hair and they were, um, they were crocheted into my hair. And so I had, but I also had long nails and everything. And so she said, the person who I was going to send would have looked at you. And would have said, she's not the right fit for this role. Now he, now this person would have interviewed you, but would have come back to me and said, she's not the right fit for this role. So I'm glad that I'm the one who did it because while you're professionally dressed, he would have looked at your hair and your nails. And so I'm like, dang, like that sucks to, it's, it, it's good to know that. 
but that also sucks to hear. Mm -hmm. So, so her honesty was unmatched, like from gate. And so we started building a very organic relationship outside of work. We talk about life stuff. We talk about work. We talk, we laugh. We like, I've cried with her. Um, we talk about health. It's like the, just, she's t taught me a lot about life. And so being able to be in that space to build an organic relationship with people, not just because you're, you need something from them because they have a level of expertise is going to be key. I tell people that all the time. If you want to slide into somebody's DM, slide in, in an organic way, do it before you need a job. So you can start building very much true and authentic and organic relationships with people. So they don't feel like you only want to talk to me because you think I can help you get a job. Mm -hmm. Now for me, I don't take it personal. If you've never talked to me, you need a job, please feel free to contact me because I understand you need a job. So I don't take it personal, but for others, they may feel like you only, you only want to talk to me because you need something from me. And so I want people to learn how to build organic relationships, especially over the computer and in this climate that we're in now. So the, the importance of mentorship for me has been organic authenticity, honesty, and being able to like legit share life with that person. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be work all the time. Man, I love that so much. So let's just pause right there. Um, I'm revamping my resume right now, right? So mm -hmm. when I first got my last role, I was just starting my locks, right? And I was like, Telling wifey, you know, because, you know, we were around the same age and I was like, mm -hmm. hey, you got to be polished. You got to do this and what is perceived as professional. Right. You like clean shaven and stuff like that. I was like, hey, I, listen, whatever role that God has for me, I'm going to have this. I, I had mm -hmm. a beard and stuff like this is how I'm rocking. Yep. And if they yep. can't see what God has gifted me with my passion, my skill set and things of that nature, I don't want it. I don't want that. Right. I don't want it. It's not meant for me. So. Okay. You know, just speaking because my uncle, he's in he's been in IT for 40 years. Right. And he's he knows this stuff. But, you know, me coming from the creative space. Right. And it's like and, you know, we have conversations about like, you know, possible IT because he has relationships. And I'm like and he, he made that comment. He was like because uh, he's older. He's like, nephew, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to give you some advice. And I'm like, OK, cool. But I, I received everything he was saying because mm -hmm. I understood and we could talk about that, like different industries, right? Creative is more free and liberal and stuff like that. Tech mm -hmm. is more, you know, professional, and especially <laughs> fintech and, and finance. We, mm -hmm. I get that. But I'm like, still, I'm still on that stance. I'm yep. still on that stance. It's like, unk, they could be paying me whatever. Like, but if I can't be me, then I do not want it. I, I'm yep. not walking on eggshells. You know what I'm saying? I'll play ball, but I'm going to be my authentic self. So let's talk about that. Is that still a real thing? in your industry or what you're saying in all across the industries or what? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I interviewed for my current job, I I kind of tested, I tested what I thought, how you should, how you should walk into an interview. So, so now don't get me wrong. I very much, I, my hair was still natural. So just picture me with a full head of hair. So natural hair, curly and everything. I still had a suit jacket on. I had on a dress. And they were like, I actually dressed as if I was going to an interview. That for me, the traditional dress to me is standard for me. Uh, but when I spoke, I talk how I talk. Mm. I don't use big words in my regular English vernacular. I don't talk like that. So I spoke how I spoke. I spoke urban. I threw some professionalism in there. But I also, I'm also animated. So you, when I'm talking, like I like to... I like, I like to talk, I like to have fun right. with, right? So when I was doing my examples and explaining like certain things, I was doing this in my chair and I was moving and I was entertaining where it took, for me, it took away the nerves because I, I technically wasn't really nervous. I was more anxious to see how the interviews are going to go. So it was more of, should I be your actual self and, and be excited and see what comes from that? And for once I once I was done my interviews, you couldn't tell me I didn't have my job. Like I so when I went into offer, I already knew I was gonna get an offer mm -hmm. because I comfortably did not rehearse being someone else. I just went in there as me. And so whatever that looked like. 
So there were times when did I stumble over questions? Yeah. Did I did I miss the mark on maybe my first question in my first interview? Yeah, because I had never experienced something like that. But I was able to back it up with other things. And so for me, it was in when I was in healthcare and in higher education, it was sitting in, in, in interviews because I sat in all of my interviews. It was sitting in interviews and watching how nervous people were who looked like me. And literally like looking at the difference in the levels of comfort based on your gender, based on your race, based on your level of profession, based on how many years of experience you have. I, d- I paid attention to all of that. And I started picking up on what to do and what not to do in interviews. So I literally did everything opposite of what a bad interview would have been. And so for me, that was, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to talk how I talk. So if you want me, then you want me as me and not as what you think I'm about to show up as. Because for me, if I am showing up with a mask on in my interview, that means I have to do that day one. That means I have to do that all day long. And I spend most of my time at work. So I don't want to feel like I need to code switch majority of my day, which means majority of my life. So I don't I like like your uncle. I don't bash people who feel like they have to because that's who that's who they've grown accustomed to be based on the times. Like one of my other mentors, she says, Shanae, at this point, I wouldn't know how to not code switch because I've been doing it for so long. I said, I respect that because that's how you have grown in your profession. Or we have a 10 year difference. You've been working 10 years longer than me. So there is a difference there. But I, I am a very, very much a big advocate of show up. So if you see any podcast that I've done, you see this haircut. If you see any, any, any event that I do, you see these earrings. And I used to, what I used to do was, um, when I, so I now have a permanent bridge. So I don't wear a retainer anymore. So now I got 32 teeth for all y'all who <laughs> I had 31 teeth. Now I got 32. So for, so I used to take out my retainer while I was talking on purpose. And I used to say, this is me. And I would take out my retainer and show I had a tooth missing here. So from my front tooth missing, and I used to say, this is who I am. And this is how I show up sometimes in at, in interviews and at events when I'm speaking. Because in order for you to be able to relate and get the gems, you need to know me, not the pro- professional me. You need to know Shanae and not the title. That is what makes people approachable. And that's what makes people comfortable. If I cannot do that, I don't belong here. Wow. That's so many. We can go on and on about that. But I do want to know uh, this. Do you feel like people of color? And I don't want to make this a a thing, though. Right. But I'm just this. We're going. But it is. So it's okay. But it is. though. So so it's okay. do Do you think because, you know, people of color, you know, specifically black people make everything cool. We're great sellers. We're great recruiters. We're great. You know, we attract, but we're not in leadership roles, right? To make change, Mm -hmm. to make impact. Uh, I'm not saying at all, but it's a very small percentage. Now, Mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? Is there a change in the climate that you're seeing? Are are there different trends? I know you're very active on LinkedIn. Uh, What Mm -hmm. are you seeing now in regards to that? So I I am seeing more, more minorities in leadership. One of the recent testimonies that I've I shared of the young lady who got the $260,000 base salary with the $65,000 sign-on bonus and $60,000 in RSU, she's black. Hmm. And she it was in a director role. So I am seeing, and that was in travel tech. Hmm. So I am seeing the trends go up in minorities because we have to also to understand that black folk are not the only minority, so are Hispanics. So I have to I have to tell myself that because Hispanics have the same thing. So um so I do see a, an upward trend. Is it's not as quickly as I would like for it to be, but I do see some change and some trying. Um and I but I also do see that we as a community don't have the experience that certain companies look for. And that could be for various, for various reasons that I'm not going to go into, but it, it 
certain certain ex- levels of experience doesn't I've learned it doesn't fit our community. And so it, and it could very well be because we may not we we as a community may not have been exposed to computer science until after college or we may not have been exposed to certain things in our community in middle school and in high school mm-hmm. where now you have a little bit more programs going on that is introducing the African American community and the Hispanic community to STEM and all of that. Where for me, it wasn't really presented to me like that in high school and in middle school. So I, so I think our community is actually behind the curve. And part of that is I don't 100% do not believe that that is our fault. Part of the reason why we're behind the curve is the level of access that we don't actually have, which is why you see me on different platforms a lot giving access to people because we don't have it. So uh so my mentor actually said to me, she said, Shanae, money is dangerous, but knowledge is even more dangerous. So you're giving knowledge and access to people that other that other people probably wouldn't give to. And so I've just learned how to dedicate people in general, no matter who you are, no matter your background, people in general having access that they would not normally have access to. But I've also learned that the African-American community and the Hispanic community, there are certain things we don't ask for because we weren't taught to ask for them. Whether we are job searching, whether we're negotiating our salary, whether we just need help in general in life, there are certain things we just do not ask for because we were not put in comfortable enough situations or circumstances to have to ask for certain things. So. I, so I think that we are in an upward trend of seeing minorities in leadership. I, I think that though it's more or less, you don't see a lot of minorities speaking out on LinkedIn specifically about their leadership role because of their company and because they have a, they have a certain level of confidentiality that they have to maintain but it doesn't mean that they're not doing the work. They're maybe doing the work behind the scenes for us. So it's so it's a it's a kind of a weird dynamic that I think we need to grow our minds a little bit and open up our hearts a little bit to people actually being advocates in different ways that makes them comfortable. Some people are advocates on paper. Some people are advocates behind the scene. I'm somebody who's in the forefront because I got a big mouth. So <laughs> I don't and I don't mind being that loud person to say, no, this is wrong, where another person's advocacy may be on, you know, a different level in a different area. So I do think I am seeing the trend go up. I just think that the trend is not as loud right now, but I am seeing it. That's that's so awesome. So what are type of what what are some type of, um, you know, conferences or, or things that you're going to be doing in the future or that you're going to be uh, just like supporting uh, and where people can like really tap in like for personal or professional development? Yeah, so I am so I'm currently trying to work on getting the render, render ATL. I'm not too far from Atlanta, so I'm trying to work on getting there. But render ATL is happening May 31st to June 2nd. And I think some of the events are even going on until June 4th. Uh, I'm also working on being a speaker at um, Blacks in Technology, so Bitcoin in Nashville. Uh, I submitted a proposal to speak also at Afrotech this year. Uh, and then next year, I'm going to be partnering with one of my colleagues. He has his, he runs his, he does his own like tech conferences in Miami next April. So he already put me on his calendar for April. I can't remember the name of it, um, but if y'all follow me, I'll definitely get get y'all some information. But those are just some quick events. I'm also having an event uh, in Charlotte on July 29th. It's called Be in the Room. And the goal of that is to put candidates in the room with recruiters, resume writers, and hiring managers to give them gems and to hopefully get some screenings done from you meeting a recruiter and hopefully meeting a hiring manager to find a role and even getting your resume revamped from an actual resume writer who has receipts on how great their services are. Uh, we did one, me and Keisha did uh, be in the room at the end of January. And so far, four people told us they got jobs. 
since our our since our event. So uh, the hope is that we we are going to do it again on July 29th in Charlotte. Uh, and the hope is that we can get more people and just in front or in the room, in the same room as people who have the decision making power. Love that so much. Recruiter Cousin, where can people find you on all social media platforms? Yeah, so you can hashtag Recruiter Cousin on LinkedIn and you can literally find every post that's under Recruiter Cousin and hit uh, hit my, my picture. My name is spelled C-H-E-N-A-E. E R K E R D. If you type in, I'm literally the only person in the world that's name is spelled that way, the first and last name together. So C H E N A E E R K E R D. You can type that in and LinkedIn. Uh, and then with Instagram, it's at Recruiter Cousin Simple. And then with TikTok, it's at Recruiter Cousin. With uh, YouTube, it's at Recruiter Cousin Consulting. So just add the consulting on the end of the YouTube. I post a lot of a lot of tips and tricks and gems and testimonies to help people just in their job search. And I'm sure we're going to have a part two. Uh, I'm just claiming it right now because you got so many (laughs) bars and I want to respect your time. But I I always ask everybody that comes on, if you can give, you know, your younger self or somebody coming up one piece of advice or one word to describe, you know, uh, what they're going through and how they could come out of that, what would it be? So I would normally say you're stronger than you think you are, which everybody says. And I would normally say everything will be okay, which is what people also say too. What I would probably say is something that my mentor says to me quite a bit is you're going through this now, but in two years, two to three years, you're going to look back and say, she was right. (laughs) It did prepare me for this. Mm -hmm. So just know that where you are now is preparing you to be where you need to be. Hey, is there? Hey, are we taking the offering or ties for today's <laughs> show? Hey, look, you're going to get saved. You're going to get a job. You know what I'm saying? And hey, you're going to be good. So listen, the scripture I live by every day, I have listen, I have to uh, Romans 831. If God is for you, who could be against you. And Philippians 4, 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing. When I say that to myself to this day, I still get emotional because it is a matter of genuinely understanding how, like, be anxious for the, for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. Like, to hear that and to really sit in that and to feel the peace of God, even when I say the scripture, that surpasses all understanding, right? Not just limited, but every bit of understanding that we don't have his peace already surpasses that, that will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So it's like the, just that alone for me, those two scriptures is what gets me through every single day. And I've actually been going through a little bit of, just kind of a little bit of life and haters over the last few months. And I I was random, I was working out the other day and I randomly heard God say, um, when enemies encamp against you. And I was like, I forgot all about that scripture. So I looked it up and I was just like, when enemies encamp around me, even then will I be confident? And I just sat in that and I was just like, oh my gosh. So it's genuinely the idea because I can hear the audible voice of God. So whenever I hear something random, I always say, oh, that's God. So literally it's the idea that in every situation I'm protected and so are you. So it's it's to know and to learn that although you may not feel God in the moment, he has not left you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He has not left you. It's believing that and and really like genuinely putting that and burying that inside of your spirit and never letting that go. I have clenched onto God for dear life many times. And so I am a firm believer and a testament to the fact that literally the only time you fail is when you give up. Listen. If you guys are listening on Apple, Spotify, make sure you guys, you know, uh, pay your tithes and offering. Uh, I'm going to be sure to leave Shanae's information in the the description. If you guys are watching on YouTube, I'm going to do the same thing. Make sure you guys pay your tithes because you guys just got saved. You just got a poem. I'm going to leave y'all with a poem. I hope I remember. You just got a job. 
Go ahead. Come on. Let's I'm going to leave y'all with a poem. I hope I remember this poem because I always, I, if I don't say it enough, I, sometimes I forget it. It's called Mary. It goes, um, I was born into a world of love filled with possibilities and situations that was birthed from a new creation. Raised by an uncle, a cousin, a dad who knew the meaning of wisdom or repetition because superstition to him did not equal precision. He raised me to be a woman with power and respect, and yet I always went for gold. He told me he was raising me to be gifted and not sold, so I. I watched his consistency, his ability to have faith in me, and I became a king's wife. This life that was given to me was not necessarily in my plans, but God told me early on that I didn't have to understand. You are the Esther of this generation with the heart of gold. Even though you may risk your life, stand up and be bold. Yes, I am Esther, the woman who put on her crown and listened, who followed wisdom rather than superstition, a woman who may feel forgotten, but who was willing to wait because I am a believer who wants love and strength. I am Rachel's sister, Leah, who knows that there is something better, even though I may feel overlooked and out of my youth. I am living proof that God will treat me like Ruth, obedient, sacred, heartfelt, and loved, who will push past the trend and stand out like the woman with the issue of blood. I am loved, the Sarah of this generation, doubtful at times, but birthed in a new creation. I am Hagar, who was abandoned by people when I was willing to try. When they left me in the desert, God saw me and heard my cry. My wives turned into answers of yeses and amens, and men all of a sudden wanted to follow my trend. I am the new creation. Battling the nose and you can'ts of this generation, the beautiful creation made of metal and concrete, stable and able from my head to my feet. I retreat the things of Jezebel and Potiphar's wife. Stepping into my Anna, I am the Mary of this life. I am Mary, not worthy of his presence. Unlike people, he didn't treat me like a peasant, rather pleasant to me. I must agree. I was chosen to birth a king, liberty. Place me in a position out of superstition and places so hollow, so easy for me to break down doors, break out of chains because I had some Naomi's to follow. I was not left behind. I did not look back into my past life. I wanted more, better, opposite of Lot's wife. Faith like Mary Magdalene, never mind the chatter because how I used to live, where I used to go, how I used to be no longer matters. I am better than I ever was before. I tell you the truth. You want me to be what you say, but I exemplify Ruth. My youth is not in vain, nor is my boundary, because behind enemy lines is where God found me. The name of this podcast or this episode <laughs> is going to be Tides and Offering, <laughs> hashtag Recruiter Cousin. Let's go. 